story when you're part of the Operation Christmas Child program, when you're part of that ministry. You're writing somebody's story. Love that. Every time we watch some of those videos, it's, it's encouraging, it's exciting that we get to be part of that ministry. So I want to encourage you again, you have two weeks to get all of your stuff together. We still have some boxes. You still have opportunities to be part of this. And if you want to do it virtually, again, you can go to the website at anchorgrayson.org and all the information's there for you to be able to do a box virtually if you're not comfortable trying to put a physical box together. I want to welcome all of you. Welcome everybody online. Everybody can be part of Operation Christmas Child. You know what's great is we, we're in November and we're creeping toward the holidays as things start to pick up and, and there's a lot, of, a lot of excitement about things going on. I want to remind our shepherd groups and people that are participating in our blessing boxes. Every year we have the opportunity to bless, home, bless homes and families that are part of the elementary school next door. If you're part of putting those blessing boxes together and collecting food, you've got a week. You need to bring that next week and make sure that we have all of that together. 
the ladies' ministry, the women's ministry, is getting ready to host their annual event, which is going to look a little different this year. And so if you're going to be part of that, if you want to be a host home for that, you have a week to sign up. I'm sure Marlene or somebody here, there you are. I'm sure you'll be at the kiosk afterwards. If you have questions about hosting or being part of that, Marlene can answer questions after the service today. Um, get ready for this. It might be the, the end of November. It might be a little cold, but we're going to have an outdoor service in a couple of weeks. All right? We enjoyed the last one we had. It's good to have as many people on property as we can. I don't know. It might be 40 degrees. Bundle up. It'll be a good time. And we'll do that on the 22nd at our normal, normal worship time. Not early like we did last time. It'll be at our normal worship time. So in a couple of weeks, we're going to be outside again. Um, and finally, as always, every week, our Wednesday night prayer time at 7 o'clock. I want to remind you of that. One other thing, I want everybody who's here and everybody who's online to hang around till the end of the service, because beginning today, as most of you, if not all of you know, we uh, about six weeks ago made it public that Pastor Steve is looking forward to the future, and we're going to be transitioning from a pastoral leadership perspective, and we want to start making sure that you're updated and have information as to that process. So hang around till the end. We're going to give you an update as to where we are and start doing that every week. At the end of the service, one of the elders will be sharing with you about that process and where we are. So I'm going to pray. Matt's going to share some scripture with us after I pray, and then we're just going to worship the Lord together. Father, it is a blessing to be here in your house today, in your presence. Father, we love you, and, and in this um, world that sometimes is uh, just so tense and, and divided, Father, I pray you unify your church this morning. Father, unify us as we come together to, for one purpose. Father, take away all the distractions and all the stuff that is in our hearts and in our heads this morning. And Father, help us to focus our eyes and our hearts on you. Father, every word that we say, everything we do, we bring glory to you. Father, I pray for Pastor Steve. I pray that you would work in his heart this morning, that you'd give him the words that he should share, that would transform us, make us more like you, so that we might glorify you throughout our lives. We love you. Thank you for this time this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. This is God's Word. This is portions of the end of Isaiah 60 and also the end of Isaiah 61. And here's what the Lord said through Isaiah. The sun shall be no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light. But the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun shall no more go down, nor your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of mourning shall be ended. Your people shall all be righteous, and they shall possess the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I might be glorified. The least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord, and in its time I will hasten it. Promise of the Lord. And then the end of 61, Isaiah 61. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, and my soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation, and he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. The Lord said a lot of strong things through Isaiah, and the Lord spoke truthfully with his people, but we also get an incredible hope through the words of Isaiah. And the hope that we have is real and it's abiding. And the Lord is the one who says he will bring it to pass. Amen? We need that hope today. Would you stand with us? And let's put our hope in the Lord this morning. Sing this with me, even though I walk. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back. I know you are near. I will fear no If 
my God is with me. Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall
As we continue to worship together, let's join our hearts and thank Jesus that he saved us. Lord Jesus, we love you, and uh, we stand today here because of you. Uh, Lord, in your, in your goodness, Lord, and in your will, and by your choosing, Jesus, you laid down your life for us, and that's what's brought us here today, Lord. That's why we have a hope that we can sing about. Lord, would you forgive us um, for forgetting that hope, or would you forgive us for devaluing it? And Lord, may our hearts learn to value and treasure you even more in these days, God, because we have a hope that's lasting. And God, we take you at your word that you gave to us in Isaiah, that you are the one who will bring to pass the completed work, not only of saving our souls, but also making everything right in the world, Lord. You are making a new creation, things in heaven and on earth. And so, Lord, we praise you today. God, give us a spirit, not of fear, 
but a spirit of power in you because we've been called by you and we can trust you as our Father. We love you, Lord. Direct Steve, give him power, wisdom, and direction, Lord. And may we, may we hear well today. May we hear your voice and obey what we hear. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake and honor. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, praise team. Uh, we'll be continuing some praise here in, in a few minutes at the end of the message. But I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm glad that you guys are watching online today. And pray that God will, will use uh, this truth in your life. Uh, we're starting a new series. It's a short series, but we're starting a new series just simply entitled, Look Up. Uh, probably good, good words for today, especially for you Bulldogs fans. Look up, right? Look up. Uh, my, brother, my brother used to have these sayings plastered all over his room. And I just remember as a little kid, I'd walk in his room and read all these sayings. And one of them said, look up. Things could get worse. And then it said in small letters, sure enough, I looked up and things got worse. Uh, that, that's not what we're talking about today. We're talking about something very different from that. Gene Getz wrote a book entitled, Look Up When You Feel Down. And that's not what we're talking about really today either. We're talking about looking up at the glorious God of this universe by doing a deep dive in His Word and letting it change us from the inside out. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to be walking through the end of the chapter over the next few weeks. Charles Spurgeon, Prince of Preachers, said this, You have eyes. God's grace has given them to you but they are capable of additional power and force. You have eyes. God wants us to see in a greater way all that he has for us. The Apostle Paul had not seen the Ephesians, and, and this was one of those cyclical letters that just did not go to Ephesus, but it went to a number of churches in the uh, area, that area of Asia Minor. But he had not seen the Ephesians for a number of years, but he had been getting reports, and he's actually in prison in Rome when he writes this letter. And in Ephesians chapter 1, all the way down from verse 3 to verse 14 is one sentence, which is incredible in the Greek. Now, in your English Bible, they've put in periods and they've, they've changed the thoughts. But in the, in the Greek New Testament, it is all one long sentence. And it is just packed full of incredible truth. And, and it's something that I've taught them a number of times here at Anchor through the years. And you see the Father in those verses. You see the Son and you see the Holy Spirit. The Father chose us. He adopted us. And He's accepted us. The Son has redeemed us, forgiven us, revealed God's will to us, and made us part of God's inheritance. And the Holy Spirit has sealed us and has become the guarantee of our future blessings. And after each section, in verse 6, in verse 12, and in verse 14, it says, to the praise of the glory of His grace. Look up. You see, as we begin to understand all that's ours in Christ, all that God the Father has bestowed upon us, all that the Spirit of God is working inside of us and our spiritual eyes begin to look up, we start seeing with a new clarity. When you look at Ephesians chapter 1, you see basically this long doctrinal statement, and then, then Paul gives thanks. He, he rejoices, and then he, he prays that they will be able to comprehend and know God more. In other words, they'll be able to look up, and they'll be able to glorify God and praise Him. I've entitled this message today just simply Spiritual Bifocals. And bifocals, 
uh, for those of you who may be getting to that age. Bifocals help you to see better far away and also better up close. And in one sense, we're going to be looking far away at some enormous truth, and then we're going to be looking up close at our own life at what does this look like when it's played out in us. And so let, let, let's ask the Lord to bless this, this new series and bless His Word today as we hear it. Father, thank You that You're the one who takes Your Word and makes it alive inside of us. We ask You now to, to take this truth and that You would set us free and that, Lord, we would not live by sight, not physical sight, but we would live by faith. And that we would have a spiritual sight that transforms us. And so, Lord, we give you this time. We ask you to keep the enemy at bay. And, God, just direct us in this journey that we're going to be going on over the next few weeks. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to divide this into, into two sections. And the first section is just simply called Sealed and Secure. So when you think about life, one of the greatest things that can ever happen to any of us is that we have a genuine faith where we can say, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. I have been converted by the Spirit of God. My life has been changed. He has come into me. He works in me. He gives me hope. He gives me peace. He gives me joy. He, he directs my path. But we need to make sure that we understand this. And the first part of this is sealed. And it, and it says, it says and sealed, in him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So when we look at verse 13, we see, first of all, it says that, that after listening to the message, in him you also, after listening to this message. Now, it means to hear. The, the Greek word means to hear, not just with your physical ears where your eardrums are reverberating, but it means to hear with an understanding. And so the Spirit of God, as Paul had given them truth, the Spirit of God made that truth come alive and they were changed by that. They were changed. Everybody in this room, if you say, I'm a follower of Christ, I have been changed, the Lord Jesus Christ came into my life through the person of His Spirit, then every single one of you had someone who shared the gospel with you. Somebody. Who was it? Who was it? Think about it just a moment. Somebody shared the gospel. You heard it. Now, you may have heard it over many, many, many different times, but ultimately at some point, somebody was the one who was sharing the gospel with you when you came to the place where you came to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you think about that, Romans chapter 10 verse 14 says, how shall they hear without a preacher? God has called all of us to share. Can, can I challenge you as your pastor? After the first of the year, I'm going to have an eight-week countdown and kind of a farewell tour, if you would. And I'm going to be challenging you with, with a lot of, of issues. But one of the issues that, that we need to get right as a church is evangelism. It's not something to be afraid of. It's not something to run from. Where you declare the gospel, successful witnessing, if you would, is simply and compassionately sharing Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then you leave the results to God. That's what God has called us to be about. So someone heard, and the Spirit of God made it come alive, and they responded to the message of truth. The message of truth. Now, in, in the Greek, it has the definite article, the truth. In other words, it is the Word of God. They heard the word of God, and it is the gospel of your salvation. It is the gospel of your salvation that you had believed. Now, we're going to talk about belief in just a moment. But when you think about the gospel of your salvation, we're living in a world uh, 
Wow, we're living in a world that's fallen. We're living in a world that's fallen. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take a scientist to understand that. It's around us everywhere. And we're living in a world that totally resists and rejects the knowledge of the truth. And because of that, when you say that there's only one way and you make this absolutely intolerant statement about narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and broad is the way that leads to destruction, it is like petting the cat the wrong direction. People will run from you or they will attack you or cancel you because you are bigoted, you're intolerant, you're uncaring, you're unloving. And yet what Paul said is to be sealed, you've, you've got to come to the place to where the gospel, which is the word of God, the Word of God gives us the truth, and it says that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and you come to that place, and when you believe, you are then sealed. You are sealed in Him. You're sealed in Him. Now, sometimes people can doubt their salvation. Some of you may have gone through a season in your life or you may be going through it right now, or it's something that has come regularly through your life. You've gone through a time when you have doubted. You've wondered, have I truly been saved? We can question the reality of things. We can, we can doubt at times. And, and as human beings, that doesn't mean that you're co-signed to the pit if you do that. It just simply means that sometimes we don't understand biblical salvation. We don't understand all that God is saying, but what this passage says to us is that God is giving us a message. We're looking up and we're hearing this message of safety and security. And he says, when I save you, I seal you. I seal you. I've actually had people debate me and say, yeah, but you know what? I can walk away from that. Really? If you're truly converted and you're sealed by the Spirit of God, you can walk away from that? Where do you find that in Scripture? That's not a teaching of the Word of God. If we're truly saved, when you go back to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Yes, there are times we can grieve the Spirit. We can even quench the Spirit. But once you are sealed, you are sealed because it is called the Holy Spirit of promise. When, when you think about the fact that we're sealed in Him, we're sealed in the Holy Spirit of promise, the Spirit is holy. He is holy, holy, holy. His mission is to make us holy, and every New Testament believer has received the Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament, the Spirit came upon people for a purpose, for a season. They did whatever was needed. They needed to be empowered or whatever, and then the Holy Spirit was removed from them. But in the New Testament, Every single believer receives the Spirit of God. And even though you can quench him or grieve him, you cannot lose him. He does not walk away from you. Romans 8, 9 says, If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So every believer has the Holy Spirit living inside of him. So they listened, they believed, they were saved, and they were sealed by the Spirit. It says you also. So there's a contrast here with the Gentiles in Ephesus and the Jews. And so he's saying, listen, all of you, it's not just the Jewish people. It's all of you believers who have received the gospel. You have been sealed. And it is, it is the, the Holy Spirit of promise who does this work in us. Now, the Holy Spirit is the seal of God's promises to you. And in one sense, there are three things that come with that. First of all, there is security. It's like the seal that's put on a tomb. And if it's God's seal, it cannot be broken. God has given you security in the fact that he says, you are mine. And so ownership, you're no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. And in authenticity, 
False believers don't have this seal. But true believers have been sealed with the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 8, 16, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So the Spirit marks us as genuine, as genuine. And he says he will convict us of sin. He will change us. He is working the work of sanctification in us. And then ultimately one day, the work of glorification. So we are sealed. But we are also, when you look at verse 14, we're also secure. Who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Who? Who? Not it. The Holy Spirit is a person. So it's talking about the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge. And when you think about given as a pledge, it is a guarantee for us. It is a guarantee. It is basically something yet to come. Our spiritual riches in Christ, and it is all a part of our inheritance that we're going to receive. And it's done with a view. Some translations say until, until the redemption of God's own possession. So in other words, we see the sweeping majesty of God's work of redemption in these verses. The whole first part of the chapter. We see past, we see present, and we see future. We're looking up, we're hearing God say, I have sealed you and you are secure in what I have accomplished in your heart and life because I am still at work and I'm going to redeem you as my own possession. When you think about what that means, there was the act of justification whereby the wrath of God was put away and we were reconciled with God because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. And then there's that process of sanctification whereby the Spirit of God is changing us from the inside out and we're being molded to look more and more and more like Christ. And then ultimately, there will be an act of glorification. Now in Scripture, when you read it, it's perfect tense when it relates to the Father. He's already seen and is done in his heart. There's a promise that's been given. You are sanctified, but in reality, as we're living out this whole process of sanctification that's going to culminate in glorification, our glorification has not yet taken place. And it won't be completed until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. And so it's planned by the Father, it's purchased by the Son, and it is presented by the Spirit of God. And all of it is to the praise of His glory. Can you say amen to that? Amen. That's why we've been saved. That's why we've been redeemed. We are living out for the praise of His glory. Now, when you think about the fact that God appointed us and we were destined to live for the praise of His glory, and God has an unwavering commitment to keep His promise especially for his own, always, but especially for his own, it's an incredible thing. It makes our heart just, uh, do you feel secure in his love today? Do you feel secure in his love? You know, one of my, one of my favorite pictures, analogies that I've shared with you guys before about this is a dad and his little girl at the ocean and the waves are bigger than normal and the little girl wants to go in the water but she's afraid of the waves. They're so big and the daddy says, take my hand. And he puts his hand down and she takes his hand and, he, and they, they walk into the water and, and she's afraid. She wants to run back. He's got her. He's got her. Nothing's going to happen to her. And the question always comes, well, who has who? And, you know, oftentimes when people are doubting their salvation, it's because they're looking at their own heart, their own life, and they don't feel secure. They, they don't feel that, that seal, if you would. They're looking at feelings. They're looking at the image of their own life and what they see and their failures, and they feel like, you know, oh, I've let go. Well, even if that little girl in her mind let go of her daddy. Who had who to start with? It wasn't her. 
He had her from the very beginning. His hand and his invitation were there from the start. He was the one who was doing the work. Sealed and secure is what God has called us to be about. But the second part of this is where I want to spend the rest of our time here is faith and love. So when we look up, and, and basically sealed and secured was, was the end of that whole doctrinal section. And so now Paul moves into a prayer. And so they, they've, heard, they've heard the truth, they've heard the doctrine, and now Paul is going to be praying, I want your eyes to be opened. I want your eyes to be opened, to, to, to see wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. I want you to understand who God is. I want you to have clear spiritual vision because it's going to impact everything. And, and when you look at this, in, in chapter 1, it kind of ends with a prayer. Then he goes through doctrine again in chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, you have another prayer. And, and both of those prayers are saying, get this doctrine. And by the time you get to chapter 4 through 6, then he's saying, and this is how you live. And so there, there's something important that we need to get that unless we understand the truth of what God has given us in his word, of who he is and who we are, we're not going to live out in practicality the truth that should be setting us free and producing an abundant life in everyday living. We've got to know the truth. That's why we need to dig in to God's Word. So look at verse 15. It says, For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ which exists among you, and your love for all the saints. So for this reason... I mean, in one sense, it's looking back at the first 14 verses. This amazing display of, of the heart of the Father, the work of the Son, the work of the Spirit, all that God has done in wrapping together what we call the gospel, the good news of how God has worked sovereignly as the Redeemer and how He has working to change us and so for this reason. But in another sense, it's also looking ahead because the prayer that Paul's going to be praying is that you would get this so that you would get life, that you would understand how to move forward in the life. So for this reason, apply this truth, live in the light of the power for His praise and glory you are to live out so that people will be pointing their eyes up to his praise and glory. And so he says, having heard. Again, not just to hear sounds, but you've heard the heart of the message. Listen to Philemon, chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers, because I hear of your love, and of the faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. And I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective, effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. So Paul gives this assurance. He wants you to get this right he wants you to know that you, if you're truly converted, that you are sealed and you are secure. But then he, he wants you to kind of look at your own life, practically speaking, and see if you're sealed and secure, then what's going to come out of you is faith and love. You're going to really be trusting and you're going to really be loving. Now, if you think I'm just kind of digging around for something, um, I, I, went through, I went through I don't know how many commentaries looking for somebody who really emphasized <laughs> faith and love. And what I found in this passage, there's so many mountaintops around that rarely ever do you have somebody zeroing in on verse 15. And yet I believe that this is an incredible thing. Because 2 Corinthians Chapter, 
13 verse 5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. First John was written that you might know you have eternal life. And so God wants us to have some sense, some deep abiding sense that yes, I am a child of God. And I see the evidence. I know the truth and I see the evidence in my own life. And so all of the truths in Scripture that talk about what it looks like to be saved can be boiled down to two things. Two things. And they're right here in this passage. If somebody comes to you and says, I'm doubting my salvation. So you look at them and you say, do you have true biblical faith in your heart? And is there love that comes out of your life? I mean, it can be boiled down to those two. Listen to these verses. I mean, clearly, you know, James 2.20 says that faith without works is dead. And you can't have faith and not have works. And so they're always put together. And there are a lot of passages in Scripture. So li listen to these faith and love passages. 1 Thessalonians 3.6. And I'm going to uh, excerpt these just for the sake of time. Timothy has brought us good news of your faith and love. And then a little bit later, 1 Thessalonians 5.8. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. 2 Thessalonians 1.3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged. And the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. Your faith is greatly enlarged and your love toward each other is growing. 2 Timothy 1.13 Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Paul said, retain the standard and it's bound up in trusting faith and love. 1 John 3, 23. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Ephesians 6, 23. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, grace, the grace of God in salvation, is the source of this faith and love which overflows in the lives of those whom God has chosen as His children and redeemed. And when God gives His grace to us. The evidence of that grace present is obviously that we've been sealed and we are secure in that sealing. But the reality of our living out is that the pattern of our life will have a heart of trust and faith and love for others. Now, how do they relate to each other, faith and love? Well, Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. And so faith produces love. Saving faith always has fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first one? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, is love. And so when the Spirit of God is at work in you, the evidence that you have true faith is that love is going to be coming out of your life. 1 Timothy 1.5, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Galatians 5.22, going back to the fruit of the Spirit. When you have the Spirit inside of you, the fruit of His presence is that you will have love. 
Now, faith is not just an initial faith. Oh, I remember the day I got saved. There used to be a song we sang when I was growing up. It was, it was on a Sunday, somebody touched me. Actually, I look back and it was a horrible theological song. I mean, it's just, it just not really good at all. But you were supposed to stand up in the church as you were going through. It was on a Sunday, somebody touched me. You know, we don't, well, we don't want to go there. But, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and people, when I was, the church I grew up in, I mean, it was all about, you tell me the moment, the time, the instance, every detail about when you were saved, that better have been right. If not, I'm going to preach a message. You're going to be doubting your salvation. You're going to come forth. We're going to baptize another 500 this year. And I saw it over and over again. There are people who, I had one friend who had been baptized probably six times. Why? Because he did not have at that time a biblical understanding of salvation. See, it's God who works in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure. And when you start saying it's all about me, we exercise faith. We're going to look at it in just a moment. But not just initial faith. The faith that Paul's talking about is living day by day by day in this walk with the Lord. So looking back at verse 15, it says, Having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you. Let me run through this hurriedly. There's so much we could say about this. But... This personal individual faith that you, not, not your mama, not your daddy, not your pastor, not your, not your life school teacher, not your grandparents have faith. And, or, or, you know, I, I say, I'm a, listen, I'm a good person. I'm a moral person. I'm a benevolent person. I, I have character. I have great ideas about how to help people. Uh, I think, you know, we're all in this boat together and we're all going to be good to one another uh, and many people will go way beyond that. They'll say, oh, but I believe in God. And they'll say, oh, I believe in God too. Uh, Donna was reading me about a, uh, a Hollywood personality that, that uh, talked about how their faith had changed her life. And, and she was telling me about everything that was written in this article. And when it got down to the end, he was a Buddhist. And how his faith had changed his life. So a lot of people will say, well, I believe in God. I, I believe in I believe in uh, a superior being, a supreme being. I, I believe in, in that there's something out there. But let me show you what it says. Faith in the Lord Jesus. That's what it says. That there's, there's no asterisk that will add your little God down at the bottom of the page if you'd like. That's not what God has given us. It's faith in. In the Lord Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate test in this world. You can talk about God all you want to. And people will, eh, you know, I'm all right. I mean, I, some will say, I don't believe in God. Or, well, I'm an agnostic. You know, I, I lack knowledge. I don't really know if there's a God or not. Or, you know, I really believe in science and whatever. And, and there's a lot of that going on today. But the ultimate test is the moment you say the name Jesus. It's like, oh, I got to go. They're out. They're, it's an irritant. There's something. And, and I can tell you what the something is. We don't have time. I mean, go to Ephesians chapter 2 and read it. There's something in control. And when they hear the name Jesus, they run. You see, when you have faith in Jesus, you've ceased having faith in yourself. It's not about what I can do. I'm not going to earn my way to heaven. I'm not going to do good works. The gospel, the good news of the gospel is that you are dead. You are dead in your sins, and God raised you to life. Jesus died on the cross in your place. He was buried. He was resurrected. He now lives inside of you in the person of his spirit. It's an incredible thing that Paul wants them to get. It's not just that God, I've heard people say, well, God loves you. God loves everybody. God forgives you. God forgives everybody. Have you come to the place where you have understood that God loved me and gave his son for me? I'm a sinner. 
I'm in rebellion. My life is full of junk. And I need a Savior who paid for my sin. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus. And he forgave me. Now, Jesus is himself the Savior. And what he did on the cross is our means of salvation. And so I cast my entire hope upon him and what he has done on my behalf. That's what faith is. I have no confidence in my own ability to save myself. I am a hopeless and lost sinner and have saved only because of the precious shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that covered my sin and turned away the wrath of the Father. Well, he received that incredible gift, what the Lord Jesus did for us. So I have no confidence in anyone else or in anything else. That's what biblical faith is. I have no confidence, no confidence in anything else or anyone else but the Lord Jesus. I have put my faith in the Lord Jesus. He is the eternal Son of God. He was born by a virgin birth. His incarnation, God in the flesh, came into this world. And Scripture tells us that He is our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 3 says that no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so it doesn't just say Jesus. Jesus is a picture of his humanity, but Lord, kurios, a picture of authority. It is his headship. It is his lordship. It is his godship, if you would. He is God in the flesh. And so I put my trust in the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, the Messiah, who came for us. And so we have this lifestyle of trusting and obeying God. It's evidence that we are saved. In good times, we rejoice. And all of the truth of Ephesians 1 through 14 are just reverberating in our hearts. It's wonderful. And in bad times, we are able to trust in Philippians chapter 4, it says that you bring your burdens, your cares, your worries, and you, you present them through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving before God and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Some of you need to do that today. Faith and love. Faith and love. And so it says your love for all the saints. So we have faith, real faith but it's accompanied by something that's powerful. It's agape. It is God kind of love. It is love that meet needs, meets needs. It is sacrificial. It is compassionate. It is unconditional. John 13, 35 says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, by this. He didn't say by these things. He said by this. <sighs> the internet. Will you take your social media heart and mouth and fingers and life and would you bring it to bear under John 13, 35? And would you say to this again, by what I'm about to write, all men who read this will know that I have love. Can you guys say amen to that? Amen. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you cannot enter into discourse. But even in whatever you do, let all things, Scripture says, be done in love. You speak the truth in what? In love. If you are this incredible intellect... And everybody follows you and, and they, they just, oh, are amazed at the insights that God gives you. First of all, you're going to be dealing with pride every single day. But if you can get beyond yourself, the one indicator that God is really at work in you 
is that you will have love. You will have love for others. So be careful before you hit that button that cannot return what you did. Be careful. The indication that you're truly saved is faith and love, this practice of love. Now, by nature, we don't really love each other. Titus chapter 3, listen to verse 3. For we also once were foolish ourselves. I can say amen to that. Disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But, but, the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared. Now, once the Spirit shows up inside of you, and He is at work inside of you, He gives you, He gives you a great love. Paul, in prison, had gotten reports that the churches in Ephesus, in that area, they were loving each other. They were, they were believing God. They were, they were walking rightly, and, and he was so encouraged. And he knows that we cannot truly love unless the Holy Spirit is at residence in our heart and our life. That he is the one who is presiding over us. 1 John 3.23 says, Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus and love one another. It says in this passage, all the saints, not just those you like, not just those who believe like you do, not just those who, you know, I've noticed something in, in re relationships. Sometimes the people that are the most popular are the people who schmooze. You know what a schmoozer is? Schmoozer, oh, you look great today. You're so smart. You're so great. You're so wonderful. You're so sweet. And if you go do that to everybody that you meet, everybody's going to like you. They're going to say, wow, I love them. They're wonderful people. Schmoozers? No, God's not called us to be schmoozers. God's called us to be real. And real love is speaking truth and encouraging people in truth, and standing by people, and along with people, and helping meet needs. That's what love does. Love meets needs. It gets down the ditch with people. It, it's rejoicing with those who rejoice. It's weeping with those who weep. It's actually having a concern for someone else in this world besides yourself. And that's supernatural. Because a lost person can only truly, deeply in their heart, only care for themselves. Now, they will care for their children. They will care for a spouse. They will care for others. But the spiritual kind of life-changing, supernatural love that God gives you for other people, it's a gift. It's something that God does. All the saints, the set-apart ones, we're to have that kind of love. And, and, you know, the truth is, I'm reminded of this often. I think about what it's going to be like. I mean, you don't go through 45 years of ministry without having some people that just really don't like you at all. And so I think sometimes, hey, I'm going to get to go to heaven. I'm going to be there for eternity. And then I remember, oh, they're going to be there too. <laughs> okay. So I get to avoid them for all eternity, right? Hey, we're gathering at the throne today. Where's he standing? Where is she going to stand? No, it doesn't work that way. Aren't you glad that we're going to all be changed? I am. Heaven would not be heaven if we were not all changed. It would be a difficult place. But we're going to be there together. It's going to be wonderful. We're, we're, we're headed to the same home. And, and all those trying people in your life are going to be changed. And guess what? You are too. Praise God, right? Right? We're going to all be changed, and we're going to be like him. So this love is not, is not this J. Vernon McGee. I, I used to love listening to J. Vernon McGee. 
I could actually sound like him, and I'm not going to do it today. But, but he said, I'm tired of sloppy agape. <laughs> I mean, he, just, he said stuff like that. I'm tired of sloppy agape. Now, love is true sacrifice. It's not sentimental. It's not a Hallmark card. It's not working up a few alligator tears or crocodile tears or whatever you want to call them. It is a commitment of the will to meet needs. It's produced in the heart of a yielded believer by the Spirit of God. And the fruit will come out. And love will confirm and validate your faith. 1 Timothy 1, verse 13 and 14 says, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, and yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. So the grace, the abundance of grace that was poured out upon Paul produced faith and love. For by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, even the faith itself, the abundance of grace that was poured out upon Paul produced faith, his response to God, and it produced love, the outflow of God's Spirit coming out of him. Look at verse 16 and we're through. It says, do not cease giving thanks for you. Obviously, Paul is, is saying that. He does not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. God is the one who's being thanked, not the Ephesians. He's thanking God. He's thanking God for what he has done in their hearts, in their lives. Sealed and secured. As we look up today, I mean, it just, it moves you up to 100,000 feet. And you just, you just see, you see things. It, it, it's, not, it's not about politics. It's not about football. It's not about finances. It's not about how good things are going in your world or your life. It is about the kingdom the kingdom of God, and the praise of His glory. It is about who He is in our lives, in our world, in our hearts, and how we live out the reality of who He is. That's what it is about. And when we get caught down at one foot level, living out, looking at ourselves in the mirror, feeling sorry for ourselves, and frustrated, and angry, and, and out of shape with everybody around us because of you name it, we miss, we miss the glorious picture of the wisdom and the revelation of God in Christ Jesus that produces a praise to His glory. We're giving the world an accurate view of His beauty and His value and His worth and His greatness. That's why we can look up today. As we leave, i got to remind you, when you get to the last book of the Bible, it says that the church in Ephesus had left their first love. Were they doctrinally sound? Yes, they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But the Spirit said, I have something against you. You've left your first love. Can I ask you a question this morning? First of all, do you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're sealed by His Spirit. You're secure in your walk. There's faith there. There's love there. It's evident. You know that you know that you know. The Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of the King. Do you have that? If you don't, then today may be the day of salvation for you. The Spirit of God wooing you. But as many as believed in him, to them gave he right to become sons of God. Are you 
willing to turn from trusting yourself and living on terra firma of a fallen world? And are you willing to look and fasten your eyes on the Lord Jesus, the God-man who went to the cross for you and gave himself that you might have life? Let me ask you to bow your heads with me just a moment. Father, we, we are so thankful for your word. And God, we want, to, we want to find in your word everything that we need for life. Lord, every moment of every day. And we know that you're fitting us for eternity with you that's going to be glorious. But God, right now, at this moment, the reality is that in many hearts, we're all over the place. Some are fearful, some are anxious, some are mad. Lord, some are prideful, some are arrogant, some are lustful. Let's, some are, are lying. God, we need to be set free. And so we look to you. Would you just do a fresh work in us? And would you restore our first love? God, would you let us remember from where we've fallen? Would you show us how to repent this morning? How to repent, Lord, how to change our mind and, and change the direction of our life. And would you let us do the first works, which I believe the first works are faith and love. Faith and love. Lord, let us walk in faith and let us love as we are walking. We ask it in Jesus' name. Now, before I say amen, because you're still in a place of prayer, would you just take a moment and would you tell the Lord what you're going to do with maybe something that he has said to your heart this morning right now before we close this prayer? Would you tell the Lord what you're going to do just silently in your own heart? Just do business with him. Father, thank you for loving us and ministering peace and truth and sometimes discomforting us so that we can see, really see the big picture and the immediate picture. Lord, thank you for spiritual bifocals this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? Is it?
Hey, excuse me. Hey, you, you can stay, stay standing. You can stay standing. I know you're all like, okay, um, what do I do? Um, we, we want to, so about six weeks ago, um, we announced and, and Pastor Steve shared with everyone about where we're headed. And first of all, I want, I want to say thank you on behalf of the elders. Go sit, sit down for a minute. Um, on behalf of the elders, Steve, Wes, Sonny, David, Jeff, Tim, myself, we, we just want to say thank you first and foremost for just your continued prayer, um, because that's what we need more than anything as we go through this process, is your prayer and your patience. Um, beginning today, we want to commit to every week giving you an update. So you're going to hear from an elder every week, end of the service, or at some point, just giving you an update of where, where things are headed, because six weeks you're like already wondering when things are going on. And, and a lot of it just has been prayer and preparation. They're just things that we're learning and going through the process and God has been faithful, um, especially in this past week, even more so, to provide maybe a little bit of clarity, but it's a process, okay? And, and hopefully all of you receive some communication and, and understand at this point, it's a process. And we're just patiently waiting for God to show us who he's going to provide and, um, as, our, as our next pastor. So thank you for praying. Um, it is a process, and we've had a number of questions over the past few weeks, not a lot, but a few and we want to keep you up to date. So there is a web on, the, on our website at anchorgrayson.org. There's a page that we've created. It's up there. It's the Pastor Search FAQ page. It's not a page that you're going to find if you go to the navigation. It's not for everybody in the public. It's for you. It's for anchor members to be able to find that. So if you want to write that down, it's anchorgrayson.org slash pastor dash search dash FAQ. And if you run it all together with no hyphens, that works too. And you'll get there and you'll see a running list of some of the questions and some of the answers um, that we've prepared for you to just keep you informed as we get that. And that'll be kind of a living page, and we'll update it as more questions come about and so on. There's also a way that you can communicate us, with us. Obviously, as elders, you can just ask questions. We're wide open. Ask questions. But there's an email address, elders at anchorholds.org, where you can communicate to us wide open and, and share any thoughts or questions that you have. So... This week, the next couple of weeks, we're, we're moving forward. There's some names. There are people that God has introduced us to. We don't know if they're the men and the families for Anchor or not. Um, but we're early in this process and going through it. And we just want to be transparent and open with you 
and, uh, and continue to ask for your prayers and give you the information that you deserve and need to know that the process is moving forward and, and that, uh, first of all, God is good. And, and we're trusting that he's, that he's going to provide uh, as we walk through this. So we just want to keep you informed. So like I said, each week you can start expecting an update. And the update might be as simple as keep praying <laughs> and, and keep seeking as, as we do the same. So uh, we'll, keep you, we'll keep you up to date. That's, that's it. So we are so thankful that you're here today. Uh, anything else we need to share? Marriage retreat. How many openings do you have left? Okay. Marriage retreat. Pastor Steve's been sharing that for the past few weeks. There are seven unpaid openings. That doesn't mean people haven't said they want to be there, but until there's money in hand, those sp spots are wide open. So there's seven open spots, max 25, right? So you've got a chance, and you'll be at the kiosk, I assume. She'll be right here. Miss Donna will be right here if you have any questions and want to write a check for your marriage retreat. So good to see you, to see you this morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all of you who are online. You are dismissed. Hey, thank you again for allowing us into your home and your life today. We're glad that you've chosen to connect with us. And that message might have stirred something up in your heart. We'd love to know how we can pray for you. You know, today might be the most important day of your life. You might have chosen to follow Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And we'd love to know that. And we'd love to give you resources and connect with you and help you in your walk with him. Here's how you can let us know how we can pray for you. Send us an email at prayerline at anchorholds.org. We'll get that email, we'll follow up with you, we'll give you whatever you need so that you can uh, gain answers and so you can grow in your relationship with Christ. Hey, thanks again for being with us online today. Whether you join us again online or you join us in person, we look forward to seeing you again next week.